Great. Thank you so much, Tiernan. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for being here today. My name is Tess Stanton, and I am from the Rocky Mountain ADA Center. And I'm so excited to be um, with you all and to have you join me for our fourth and final session in this um, multi-month training series that we've been going through. Today, we're going to be talking about emergency preparedness and the ADA, uh, which I, th I think a very highly relevant relevant topic for everyone, but especially, you know, in the realm of work that you're in. So I'm, I'm extremely excited to be here sharing it with you today. Just to give an introduction, um, I, again, my name is Tess Stanton. I am a white woman. I have very fair skin and I have dark brown hair, which is pulled back into a ponytail today. I'm wearing a black headset and I'm wearing a solid black blouse. And behind me, I have a virtual background. Thank goodness for virtual backgrounds because I'm in the middle of a house move. So I would be uh, not in a very good place without the use of these virtual backgrounds. It's a navy blue background that has the Rocky Mountain ADA Center's logo on it. And if you've been to one of these sessions with us before, you know that we always have to start with this disclaimer, which says information, materials, and or technical assistance are intended solely as informal guidance and are neither a determination of your legal rights or responsibilities under the ADA nor binding on any agency with enforcement responsibility under the ADA. The Rocky Mountain ADA Center, operated by the University of Northern Colorado, is funded under a grant from the National Institute on Disability Independent Living and Rehabilitation Research, Nidler Grant Number 90 DPA D0014, to provide technical assistance, training, and materials to Colorado, Utah, Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Wyoming on the Americans with Disabilities Act. And for those of you who have been at the previous sessions, you probably are pretty familiar with who we are and what we do. But if anyone is um, joining us new today or, you know, time has passed since our last session. So if you just kind of need a refresh, I always like to give an overview of where I'm coming from and what we do in my office. Just in case you could ever use us as a resource in the future, um, not even intended as self-promotion or any kind of plug, uh, you know, for for monetary purposes, but rather just because we love to help and not a lot of people know about us um, or a lot of people do know about us, but we always want more. We always want as many as we can to know about the help that we provide uh, because it can be can be very valuable depending on your occupation or your circumstances. So again, I'm from the Rocky Mountain AD. ADA Center, and we are just one of many ADA centers that are dispersed throughout the entire United States. So we're part of the ADA National Network, and what the ADA National Network, or the ADANN is, is it's a collection of ADA centers in the United States that provide training, materials, and guidance on the Americans with Disabilities Act. So we are a, um, you know, we, we provide free services, free resources, and if you are ever in a situation where you want to know more about your rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, if you're someone with a disability or maybe you have a loved one with a disability, or maybe in your career and the work that you do, you want to know more about your responsibilities um, to employees, to patrons under the Americans with Disabilities Act, and you're not really sure, um, you know, what the law says or, or how it relates to your situation, and you're just kind of confused. You know, maybe you're thinking, I know that this is an ADA situation, or I think this is an ADA situation, but I'm not totally sure. I just need to talk to someone. I need to talk to an expert. You can call us or your local local ADA center. So the Rocky Mountain ADA center where I'm coming from serves region eight, which consists of Colorado, Utah, Wyoming, North Dakota, South Dakota, and Montana. But like I said, there are ADA centers throughout the entire United States. So if you're not located in one of those states that I just mentioned, or maybe you know someone outside of our region who might need some ADA help, if you're within the United States, if they're within the United States, 
you'll have a local ADA center you can call. Maybe it's not the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, maybe it's another ADA center, but but you can call. And all you need to do is call the number on the screen, which is 1-800-949-4232. And depending on the area code of the phone number that you're calling from, you'll actually be routed to your local ADA center. Or if you're someone who likes to, you know, send emails, um, maybe like a paper trail or you just work a little better online, maybe you have a really complicated question that it's much easier to write it out than it is to, to speak it, you can go on to www.adata.org. That's the website for the national network. And you can find all of the individual regional ADA centers websites through that kind of larger umbrella website if you want to submit an online inquiry. So the services we provide, the biggest one is technical assistance or TA. That's that's when you can actually utilize that service. If you have a question, you can call, you can go online and ask a question and be connected with an ADA expert, not a robot, not artificial intelligence, but a real human person who has ADA expertise and talk through your situation to receive informal guidance. Now, we are not an enforcement agency, so we don't enforce the ADA. We just educate on it. Now, there are agencies that do enforce the ADA. So if you're in a situation where you need to escalate to the point of enforcement, um, we're not able to intervene, but we can we can lead you in the right direction. We can tell you where we you need to go. Or, you know, maybe you have a question that's that's outside of the scope of what the ADA centers do, or, or maybe there's another organization that's better suited. Well, the ADA centers are very well connected throughout the United States to, um, you know, state and local governments, to other disability organizations, to just resources in general. So if we can't answer your question, we'll show you where you need to go. We conduct research, we provide low cost training. The Rocky Mountain ADA Center has a whole catalog of online trainings. All you have to do is go to our website, rockymountainada.org. And you can take online trainings that are free and self-paced from service animals to um, ADA overview to accessible parking and so on and so forth. And we also have a social media presence. So you can follow along with us or connect with us on there. We're on most social media platforms, including TikTok. Um, our TikTok is is really growing. Uh, we're, we've definitely been investing a lot in TikTok. So uh, check us out if you haven't already. And so now we'll go ahead and um, dive into today's topic. So here are our learning objectives for this session. We're going to review the Americans with Disabilities Act and its definition of disability. We're going to discuss inclusive emergency management and preparedness. And we're going to recognize best practices for including people with disabilities in emergency processes. And as always, please do not hesitate to ask questions using the chat box or by unmuting yourself however you're most comfortable. You're also always free to connect with us or your local ADA center outside of this session if you have one-on-one -on -one questions or if you have questions that come up after today's session is over. And as always, I'll make sure that, um, you know, Tiernan has a copy of these slides for distribution, so don't feel pressured to take extensive notes or memorize all the information. Or if at any point you can't hear me, um, you know, you can't see my slides, anything like that, if, if I all of a sudden mute myself, uh, which I did do in a training yesterday, <laughs> um, feel free to unmute yourself and interrupt me at any point. Um, please, please do that. And also, uh, we are joined by a sign language interpreter today, which is really exciting. And so if you need to, you can always pin my video, pin Jamie's video. Um, Jamie is our interpreter as well. Okay, so a little bit of review from our previous sessions, just to kind of set the stage or if you weren't able to attend previous sessions. So on July 26, 1990, President George H.W. Bush signed the Americans with Disabilities Act or the ADA into law. And the purpose of this civil rights law is to make sure that people with disabilities have the same rights and opportunities as everyone else. So the ADA gives civil rights protections to individuals with disabilities and guarantees equal opportunity in public accommodations, employment, transportation, state and local government services, and telecommunications. And the ADA is divided into five titles, which you can kind of um, 
think of as sections that relate to different areas of public life. And the ADA is descriptive and not prescriptive. So again, you may be familiar with this if you've attended our previous sessions, but this basically just means that the ADA does not prescribe exactly what to do in every single situation of discrimination, but rather it describes generally what non-discrimination should look like. So because of that, the ADA is not a one size fits all law, but rather it's very much a case by case law. And the this broadness is actually by design because everyone experiences different, everyone experiences disability differently. And because the law is so broad, it's able to be implemented across those various sectors of public life from state and local governments to employment, to places of public accommodation, to transportation, so on and so forth. But of course we recognize that this broad can can lead to confusion, which is why your ADA centers are there to help. Um, but don't be surprised if you call us up and ask a question and we say it depends because um, it depends is a pretty common answer or at least start to an answer for ADA questions because how the law is applied very much depends on the particulars of the situation at hand. But in short, the ADA is not a one size fits all law. It's very much a case by case law. And so, as I mentioned, the ADA is divided into five main sections, which are called titles. And your entity may have various obligations under various titles, depending on what you do and kind of where you receive your funding from. So, Title I is designed to help people with disabilities access um, equal employment opportunities and benefits, just as people without disabilities can. And this portion of the law is enforced by the United States Equal Employment Opportunity. Commission. Most employers with 15 or more employees, including part-time employees and state and local governments of any size, uh, must comply with Title I. Title II of the ADA prohibits discrimination against qualified individuals with disabilities in all programs, activities, and services of public entities. So basically, it's ensuring that people with disabilities are receiving equal access in state and local government services, programs, um, offerings, so on and so forth. And that title is regulated by the United States Department of Justice. Title III prohibits private places of public accommodation from discriminating against individuals with disabilities. And places of public accommodation are kind of your everyday services, places you go for those services, grocery stores, retailers, um, social services, pri private businesses, essentially. And that, that title is also regulated and enforced by the Department of Justice. And then we have um, Title IV, which covers telecommunications, and Title V, which are all the, the miscellaneous provisions. Most of the time, ADA questions are either going to fall into the Title I, Title II, or Title III categories. And again, these next few slides are review from our previous sessions, but I wanted to include them to reiterate the prevalence of disability and why access matters. So the ADA defines a person with a disability as a person who has a physical or mental impairment that substantially limits one or more major life activities. The ADA also protects people who are discriminated against because they have a record of such an impairment, like someone who had a disability, but maybe now their disability is in remission but they could still be discriminated against for having that record. And the ADA also protects people who are discriminated against because they are regarded as having such an impairment. Um, and then finally, the ADA also protects people who um, could be discriminated against because of their association with a person with a known disability. And it's important to remember that the ADA does not give an exhaustive list of conditions that qualify as disabilities, because as I said earlier, everyone experiences disability differently, and some people may not have a name or diagnosis for their substantially limiting impairment, but it doesn't mean that they don't have a valid substantially limiting impairment that they could be discriminated against um, for having that impairment. 
And again, just to really drive home the prevalence of disability. So the CDC reports that 26% of adults in the United States have a disability. And it's safe to assume that this number is actually underrepresented and actually a lot more people than 26% of adults in the United States have a disability. But this just shows that if we leave people with disabilities out of considerations, particularly emergency considerations, we are leaving out a considerably large portion of our population. When it comes to emergency management and preparedness, instead of the word disability, you'll often hear the term access and functional needs, or AFN. And the Federal Emergency Management Agency, or FEMA, states, quote, people with access and functional needs includes individuals who need assistance due to any condition, temporary or permanent, that limits their ability to act. To have access and functional needs does not require that the individual have any kind of diagnosis or specific evaluation. Individuals have access and functional needs may include, but are not limited to, individuals with disabilities, seniors, and populations having limited English proficiency, limited access to transportation, and slash or limited access to financial resources to prepare for, respond to, and recover from the emergency, unquote. So, some people have a condition that may not always qualify as a disability under the ADA, such as, you know, for example, having a broken leg or being pregnant, but could still be considered a person with access and functional needs in an emergency. Today, we'll be focusing on disability and inclusive emergency management, but remember that keeping access and functional needs in mind means remembering underrepresented and underserved communities in addition to disability, such as people with limited English proficiency. And historically, people with disabilities have not always been included in emergency management and planning. Typically, emergency managers have consisted of people in the military, law enforcement, and first responders, but people with disabilities and people who experience living with access and functional needs were not given an intentional spot at the table. And something I hear a lot when it comes to the ADA and disability is you don't notice it until it affects you. And that's especially true in the case of emergency management, right? If the people who are making the plans are all non-disabled, they're not going to have the lived experience that makes it possible to factor in access and functional needs effectively. So while emergency planning can be very well intentioned, there's going to be gaps unless you are not only considering but also including the input of people with access and functional needs. People with disabilities have a wide variety of communication, support, and health needs that differentiate them from non-disabled people, so it's necessary to consider that when planning for emergencies. Excluding access and functional needs from plans can send the unintentional message that the safety of people with disabilities is less valuable than that of non-disabled people, just like how physical barriers can send the message to disabled people of, you're not welcome here, right? And now, of of course, just as is the nature of the ADA in general, the nature of emergencies is that there's no one size fits all method. You know, you can never be 100% prepared and you there can never be 100% coverage for people with disabilities because everyone has different needs. However, considering access and functional needs ahead of time will bring you so much closer to that 100% than you would have been without that consideration. In a webinar for the Pacific ADA Center, L. Vance Taylor, Chief of the Office of Access and Functional Needs in the California Governor's Office of Emergency Services, explains these three guiding principles of inclusive emergency preparedness and management. And those three principles are integration, 
partnership, and synergy. Integration means bringing stakeholders, so people with access and functional needs, to the table to include them in decision-making and emergency planning. This is really the key to inclusive emergency management. You know, you want to include people with disabilities in the planning processes and to accurately identify what kinds of accessibility services may be needed in various situations and how to provide them. You must solicit the input of those potentially affected. This will help you have those kind of, you know, wow, I would have never even thought about that moments to make sure all areas are covered and the planning is accurate. This may look like convening an advisory group or council of people with disabilities or people who work closely with disabled people or gathering community feedback through a survey or a form. And in our office's experience at the Rocky Mountain ADA Center, people and the disability space are really, really eager to serve on these kinds of groups and provide input. Partnership means getting input from different offices and organizations, et cetera. The community has to be aligned in emergency planning in order to actually operationalize the plans. This may be your local disability rights organizations, centers for independent living, first responders, the Red Cross, a federal emergency uh, management agency or FEMA, um, state emergency management and services, office contacts, and so on. You have to find those sources that you trust. And I will say that my specialty is not emergency management, and I'm not an expert in it. I wouldn't claim to be an expert in it. But the resources out there for emergency management, particularly when it comes to access and functional needs, are vast. So if you, I can't answer your question, I will pass it along. And the Pacific ADA Center, for example, um, has a whole online webinar series specifically devoted to emergency preparedness, including a catalog of archived webinars that you can explore. I also know that the Centers for Independent Living have been especially helpful to emergency management offices in identifying the potential needs of people with disabilities. And you can find local Centers for Independent Living throughout the country. Sometimes they're called independent living centers or independent centers as well. And the third principle is synergy. When you find those partnerships and work together, the results will be more efficient and effective. Emergency preparedness cannot be achieved in a vacuum. It takes the efforts, collaboration, and cooperation of the whole community. So what are the various aspects of emergency management? Well, emergency management and preparedness goes further than what occurs before an emergency. Here are some measures to consider for comprehensive emergency management incorporating access and functional needs. So those would be preparation, so advanced planning for emergencies and disasters, testing of preparedness, um, notification, so alerting the public to emergencies and disasters and to available programs, services, and activities, community evacuation and transportation, emergency shelter programs, temporary lodging and housing, social services and emergency slash disaster related benefit programs, emergency medical care and services, relocation of programs, activities and services, transition and transportation back to the community following an emergency or disaster, emergency and disaster recovery program services and activities, and remediation of damage caused by emergencies and disasters. So repairing and rebuilding damaged facilities, removing debris, and relocation and reintroduction of state and local government program services and activities following an emergency or disaster. So lots of steps to consider there. Now we'll kind of break it down and discuss best practices in these major areas, which are communication, transportation, sheltering, and personal preparedness. These are practices that have been implemented by emergency managers. And again, I want to acknowledge that emergency management is definitely an it depends topic. How you operationalize inclusive emergency management will heavily depend on your community, your budget, your needs, your resources, the emergency itself, et cetera. However, these are some considerations, again, that I have seen operationalized recently by emergency managers that help ensure all people are considered when it comes to emergency preparedness and response. 
So people who have vision, hearing, or speech disabilities use different ways to communicate. So for example, people who are blind may give and receive information audibly rather than in writing, and people who are deaf may give and receive information through writing or sign language rather than through verbal speech. And a combination of notification methods will be more effective than relying on one method alone. And combining visual and audible alerts will reach a much greater audience than either one method alone. The last thing that we want when it comes to emergency management is for someone to miss out on crucial information because it was not presented in various formats. Something that is extremely important when it comes to emergency communication but is often overlooked is the inclusion of sign language interpreters. Sign language interpreters should be present at press conferences, community meetings, town halls, so on and so forth. When communication is televised, make sure the sign language interpreter is present, that they are well lit, they are clear, they are well positioned, and they are always visible on screen. It helps to build connections with local interpreters so that you're not scrambling to find someone at the last minute when these situations arise. And it's also important to do your due diligence to know that you're getting the right people to interpret. As we know from our previous sessions on accessible communication, not everyone who can sign can interpret. And we've also seen many public instances of fake interpreters where sign language interpreters were not signing accurately at all. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, um, you can look it up on Google and YouTube and, and watch some videos and news stories about that. So make sure interpreters are qualified. To be a qualified sign language interpreter under the ADA, an individual must be able to interpret effectively, accurately, and impartially, both receptively and expressively using any necessary specialized vocabulary. And under the ADA, an individual does not have to be certified in order to meet this standard of being a qualified sign language interpreter. However, be aware that state laws may require certified interpreters, not just qualified interpreters, superseding the ADA. So be sure to check those local laws. For example, states may have trainings and certifications specifically for interpreters to learn effective interpreting for disaster and emergency response. So again, under the ADA, sign language interpreters must be qualified but there may be state and local laws that not only require interpreters to be qualified, but also require them to be certified for certain situations and contexts. To find an interpreter, the National Registry of Interpreters for the Deaf, or RID, which is linked in the slides, hosts an online database for interpreters, and you can also seek refers, referrals from state offices for deaf and hard of hearing or local chapters of the National Association of the Deaf. If possible, it's helpful to allow interpreters access to any pre-meetings and briefings before public communication takes place. And this way they have a sense of the situation and can anticipate what will be said and can ask any questions if they have them. And if you're not someone who is directly involved with the planning of this kind of public communication, you can still make a difference at the individual level by raising concerns when interpreters are absent when they should be present, whether that looks like calling state or local government offices, um, you know, raising those concerns through social media or getting in touch with your local ADA coordinator. When it comes to accessibility, public demand is usually the most powerful catalyst for change and the reason we see sign language interpreters included in this kind of communication at all. <clears throat> When you're engaging in outreach, make sure you're keeping all audiences and abilities in mind. Inclusive outreach um, is especially important in emergency management because the information applies to everyone and inaccessible emergency outreach can have a much greater implication than other kinds of lost communication. So when you're distributing emergency plans, notifications, warnings, safety information, or other kinds of critical information, you can reach 
reach more people by making it available in various formats. This may mean um, distributing materials in print, in large print, audio, video, braille, and so on. Not only is it helpful for people with disabilities that affect hearing or sight, but also for people who have cognitive or learning disabilities and have specific learning styles. Distributing communication through various channels is also helpful. So someone's disability may dictate the channels from which they receive news. Consider the channel and keep accessible design in mind accordingly. So for both physical and digital materials, ensure that there is sufficient contrast between text, images, and backgrounds. Use plain language. So plain language is writing designed to ensure the reader understands as quickly, easily, and completely completely as possible. It avoids, avoids convoluted um, language, jargon, and acronyms. When you're engaging in digital outreach, make sure all images have alternative text for screen reader users. And this is especially important if you're distributing pictures of text, which is common in emergency management. Include accurate captions on all videos. Open captions are those that are burned into a video and cannot be turned on and off, which should be considered if you expect a video to be repurposed or redistributed. This means the captions will always be part of the video, no matter where the video is downloaded, uploaded, no matter where it goes. If you're publishing videos, consider having a second version with an audio description. Audio description is a verbal description with visual elements in a video, and it allows people who are blind or have low vision to more fully experience videos and receive information. And think about this. If you publish a demonstration video showing nonverbal actions, unless there's audio description, someone who is blind will miss out on what's going on in that video. The guidelines for making content accessible goes far beyond what I just listed, but we're always happy to chat about specifics, so reach out to your local ADA center if needed. And we had a session expounding on accessible communication back in March, but I also linked our online course catalog where you can find free courses on social media accessibility, document accessibility, presentation accessibility, and more. And although we can try and maybe even get really close, we can't anticipate everyone's needs. All people are different and so are all disabilities. And because that's the case, it's helpful to make it clear where people can go or whom they can contact for alternative formats or modification requests. Another practice that I've learned is impactful when it comes to emergency management is including people with disabilities in public service announcements, especially when those PSAs are targeted toward people with access and functional needs. This shows people that they are represented and that they're being considered. Someone is much, much more likely to lean into information and kind of pay attention if they can recognize themselves in that information. Here's an example from the California Office of Emergency Services of kind of what I'm talking about. During a disaster, individuals with an access and functional need may require special assistance, making it important to prepare ahead of time to minimize impacts. If you've got an access or functional need, it's not always easy. First off, we have to sign up for emergency alert, warning and notifications because we want to know when fires start, where they're going, and what we have to do in response to those fires. It's important for everyone, including those with access or functional needs, to have a plan in place before an emergency happens. Create a support system of four people who could potentially help you when evacuating. We can't expect that any one of those people are going to be available all the time, but if you plan to go four people deep, you can expect that at least one of those people is going to be available when you need them. Proper planning is essential to successful evacuations and should be practiced on a regular basis. Take what you actually need. That could be medicine. It should be phone numbers of your doctors, of any loved ones. It should be also any resources or food or things that you're going to need come up with a list, it's gonna be unique to you. For more information and preparedness tips, visit news.caloes.ca.gov and follow us on all of our social media platforms. 
And proper signage also goes a really long way when it comes to communication in emergencies. Generally, ADA signs are required at every doorway. More specifically, federal regulations dictate that every permanent room or space in U.S. public buildings be marked with an identifying sign. And per the 2010 ADA Standards for Accessible Design, which we'll talk a little more about later, ADA compliant signs serve three primary purposes. One is to identify permanent interior rooms and spaces. Two is to provide direction to or information about permanent interior building spaces. And three is to identify, direct to, or inform about accessible features via the International Symbol of Accessibility, or ISA, and other required accessibility symbols. Per the ADA standards, ADA signs are necessary in the following public building areas. Exits, so that's exit passages, including doors, stairs, and routes. Those should all be identified with a sign, and signs must include braille and raised characters. Pictograms are optional on exit signs, but can be very helpful. Um, another necessary area is areas of refuge. So people often wonder, what should wheelchair users do? in a building fire when the elevator is inaccessible. Well, generally, stairways will have areas of refuge for people who can't use the stairs, and it's standard operating procedure for first responders to go to these areas first to evacuate people who cannot use the stairs to exit. Areas of refuge are required per building code, not required per the ADA, but they should be marked with signage per the ADA. This type of sign should include braille, raised characters, and the international symbol of accessibility pictogram. And areas of refuge must also contain signage with instructions that direct people on actions to take during an emergency. And this signage um, should, it, you know, signage visual characters are not required to include raised content, although it is helpful. Um, pictograms are also optional on this type of ADA sign, but are again, helpful. And finally, signage is required um, for inaccessible entrances, elevators, and restrooms. So inaccessible entrances, elevators, and restrooms must have directional signage indicating the location of the nearest accessible entrance elevator or restroom. Those signs must include visual characters. Um, Braille and pictograms are not required on directional signage, and the international symbol of accessibility is required at the accessible entrance elevator or restroom if not all entrances, elevators, or restrooms are accessible. And for more information on ADA signage and for a visual demonstration, I've gone ahead and linked in the slides the U.S. Access Board's animation on signs, or you could go into Google and search U.S. Access Board signs animation, and it should be one of the very first results, if not the very first result. There's also accessibility considerations you can keep in mind for one-on-one -on -one interactions and emergencies, especially if you're a first responder. If you're not sure how someone best communicates and functions, just ask. For example, someone who is deaf may read lips, or they may use sign language, or they may use spoken word. And same thing with needs. Rather than assuming someone's needs, it's best to ask when you can. Another barrier um, people with disabilities often face is infantilization. So make sure you're always speaking to people age appropriately. Slowing down interactions can also be incredibly helpful. And I definitely want to acknowledge that this may not be possible in emergencies, but if it is, slowing down an interaction can be a lot more productive than escalating it. Slowing down also may help avoid actions based on assumptions. So for example, someone may be a may appear to be under the influence of drugs or alcohol, but their actions or speech may actually be related to their disability, not substances. Or let's say someone has a disability that affects their speech and needs a little more time to express themselves. Slowing down that interaction gives them more space to communicate. If you are a person with access and functional needs, it helps responders if you're very clear about those needs. Same thing if you are the companion of a person with access and functional needs. I recently interviewed a woman who trains law enforcement and emergency responders on interacting with people with disabilities, and she has a child with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And she told me that it's 
absolutely crucial to be very clear and specific and calls for help about what's helpful and and de-escalating for her child and what could make the situation worse. So she said, you know, if she were to make a call for help, you know, to a first responder, she would tell them, hey, my 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 child loves unicorns. Right now, if I were to present a unicorn to my kid, she's upset with me, so it's going to escalate it. But if you do it, it might be helpful. So being really clear and specific in, in those calls for help can be incredibly helpful. When it comes to evacuation and transportation, it's really important to keep the accessibility of transportation in mind. If a wheelchair user rolls up to a vehicle that is inaccessible, they either cannot board or they have to leave their mobility device behind and be carried on, which are huge compromises to safety and dignity. So emergency managers have gotten ahead of this by mapping out locations where people with access and functional needs will need to evacuate and then identifying accessible transportation providers and establishing an evacuation plan or map in partnership with one another. Ensure that transportation plans address people with disabilities needs to transport mobility aids such as wheelchairs or scooters, oxygen tanks, or other medical equipment and service animals. For people not in facilities, bus stops can be designated for people to receive transportation assistance. And for more information on accessible transportation, I've linked a source from the ADA National Network on the ADA and accessible ground transportation in the slide. In terms of sheltering, the Department of Justice states, quote, when emergencies arise, communities often provide residents and visitors with safe refuge in temporary shelters. Shelters are sometimes operated by government entities themselves, but more often they are operated by a third party. Regardless of who who operates a shelter, the ADA generally requires shelter operations to be conducted in a way that offers people with disabilities the same benefits. So for example, safety, comfort, food, medical care, the support of family and friends provided to people without disabilities. Because sheltering programs are critical to ensuring the safety of people with disabilities and emergencies and disasters, ADA requirements for sheltering are discussed in greater detail in two standalone technical assistance documents that state and local governments can provide to shelter operators to assist them in planning to meet the needs of people with disabilities in shelter environments. While these technical assistance documents do not address all ADA compliance issues that may arise in emergency shelters, they address a number of the most common access problems. The first of these technical assistance documents, which is called the ADA and Emergency Shelters, Access for All in Emergencies and Disasters, discusses the ADA's non-discrimination requirements for shelter programs. And the second technical assistance document, which is titled ADA Checklist for Emergency Shelters, includes two assessment tools to help state and local governments and emergency shelter operators ensure that emergency shelters provide access to all. So one, it includes a preliminary survey tool that will help in deciding if a facility has the accessibility characteristics that make it a good candidate for potential emergency shelter. And two, it includes a more detailed checklist that will help identify the most common architectural barriers to access for people with disabilities found at emergency shelters. Now, I will caution you to pay attention to the notices in these technical assistance documents if you use them to ensure that the standards and regulations you're using are up to date, but the overall practical considerations contained in these two documents are very, very helpful, and I have contained both of those documents. Um, I've linked them in the slides. Also stated by the Department of Justice, quote, before designating a facility as an emergency shelter, emergency managers and shelter operators need to determine if it's accessible. Elements such as a shelter's parking, walkway to the entrance, toilets, bathing facilities, drinking fountains, sleeping areas, food distribution and dining quarters, first aid slash medical unit, emergency notification system, and other activity and recreation areas need to be examined for barriers, unquote. Now, we covered briefly um, 
this document in our first session together, but I wanted to revisit it as it pertains to the physical accessibility of shelter facilities. So physical accessibility requirements under the ADA are addressed in the 2010 ADA standards for accessible design. And what this is, is it's a book that sets the minimum requirements for state and local government facilities, as well as public accommodations and commercial facilities to be readily accessible to and usable by people with disabilities. I kind of like to think of this book as the handbook for accessible spaces. It is a really long handbook and detailed handbook, but kind of a handbook nonetheless. For example, it specifies how wide accessible parking spaces must be and where to place grab bars in restrooms. These regulations adopted revised enforceable accessibility standards and the standards were scrutinized and studied by the United States Access Board prior to adoption. So they're not random requirements. Um, they're very meticulously thought out and implemented requirements that ensure physical accessibility in, in physical environments for people with disabilities. And I wanted to again mention the standards in this session because when it comes to accessible facilities, the standards will tell you all you need to know to meet the minimums. Knowing what they are and how, learning how to use them is an absolute game changer, but still they are very technical and everything they require can't be covered in one training session. But if you need to use the standards, you can actually find them online through the United States Access Board or the Department of Justice. Um, the Access Board also has really great animations on their YouTube channel that explain parts of the standards in a more practical sense, like the signage video I mentioned earlier. And you can also find a checklist using the standards from the New England ADA Center, or you can take our online course on the standards as a starting point. And again, you can always call your local ADA Center with specific specific questions for technical assistance regarding the accessibility of your facility. And in addition to these standards, bringing accessibility consultants and people with disability knowledge and experience to assess and test the usability and accessibility of shelters is a really practical way to ensure someone with a disability can actually access your shelter without barriers. And practical considerations could include, you know, could someone with a physical disability who uses a wheelchair or other mobility device use our restroom? Are there grab bars and enough clear floor space for maneuvering a wheelchair in and out of a restroom or a restroom stall or showers or doorways or hallways? Are there any objects protruding out of the wall that could be hazardous for someone who is blind? Are our entrances accessible and are ramps and elevators provided where stairs are a means of entrance? Again, those practical considerations go much further than what I just listed, but those are some of the most common um, practical considerations when it comes to physical accessibility. And here I've linked an example of the United States Access Board's animation um, showing what makes a toilet room accessible and actually shows a, an animation of a person using the toilet room who's a wheelchair user. We won't watch the whole thing just for the sake of time, but I did want to really clearly include it um, in this training so that you can go back to it and watch it later if you kind of want to see what it means to make a toilet room accessible and, and why the requirements are the way they are by watching someone actually who's in a wheelchair use an accessible toilet room. And beyond the physical accessibility of shelters, it's important to consider the additional supplies that may be needed for people with disabilities. Some people with disabilities may have to evacuate their homes or facilities and leave behind their life-sustaining medication and equipment. And emergency managers and shelter operators need to make arrangements so people with disabilities can request and obtain emergency supplies like medication and equipment. It's also helpful helpful to have as much durable medical equipment as possible already on hand, like wheelchairs, canes, walkers, scooters, blood sugar test strips, and anything else that you're able to obtain. Many people with disabilities require medication that must be refrigerated, so shelters should have a secure refrigerated location where medication can be stored and accessed when needed.
Some people with disabilities require life-sustaining equipment that's powered by electricity. And when electrical power is available in emergency situations, access and priority should be given to people who depend on this kind of equipment to survive, such as those who use ventilators, suctioning devices, battery-powered wheelchairs and scooters, and other life-sustaining equipment. Now, if electrical power is not available um, or there are extended power outages, having portable power units can be really helpful. Um, so you want to make sure that those portable power units are available and they're charged. Some people are unable to eat certain types of food because of their disabilities, and this could include people with diabetes or severe allergies. So in planning food supplies for shelters, emergency managers and shelter operators should consider foods and drinks for people with common dietary restrictions. I've seen emergency managers also have trailers that are ready to go with equipment and supplies to be deployed to shelters as needed if there are not enough resources to have these supplies at every single shelter. I've also seen accessible bathroom and shower trailers used outside of facilities that don't have them inside, although in facility accessible bathrooms and showers are always going to be the most ideal. And while supplies and equipment might pertain more to folks who have physical disabilities, it's also important to remain mindful of the needs of people with non-apparent disabilities, such as cognitive and psychiatric disabilities. These are often disabilities that are not immediately obvious, but are just as real and valid as those disabilities that are obvious. And the stress from the noise and crowded conditions of a shelter, combined with the stress of the underlying emergency, may be triggering to individuals individuals. So without periodic access to a quiet room or a quiet space within a larger room, some people with disabilities may find it increasingly difficult to be in a shelter environment, or other shelter residents and volunteers may want a break from the noise in the crowds as they're volunteering. So quiet, low stimulation environments can help people relieve stress and avoid overstimulation. Also, if possible, having mental health providers available on site or virtually to talk will help people experiencing overwhelming stress and crisis. And many people with disabilities rely on service animals to do things they cannot do themselves. And it's important to remember that service animals are not pets, but rather they perform necessary and sometimes life-saving tasks for people with disabilities. As such, shelters may need to modify no pets or no animal policies to welcome people who use service animals. When evacuating during an emergency, some individuals aren't able to transport enough food and water for their service animal, and so shelter operators need to make food, water, and relief areas available so individuals can feed and care for their service animals. Shelter operators should also make reasonable modifications to security screening procedures so people with disabilities are not repeatedly having to, um, you know, go through long waits at security checkpoints when they have to take their service animal outside for relief. And under the ADA, service animals are distinct from emotional support animals, pets, and other animals, and that they are defined as dogs or miniature horses that are individually trained to do work or perform tasks for people with disabilities. Generally, Title II entities, which are, you know, state and local government programs, and Title III entities, which are places of public accommodation, so most public places, must permit service animals to accompany people with disabilities in all all areas where members of the public are allowed to go. So this would include most shelters. Although many service animals wear vests identifying them as a service animal, vests are not required under the ADA. In fact, there is no certificate, ID, or documentation service animals are required to have under the ADA. They just have to meet that definition from the last slide to be considered a service animal. And instead of presenting paperwork or proof of training, service animal handlers only have to provide credible verbal assurance that their animal is a service animal when asked. 
Some state and local laws also define service animals more broadly than the ADA does, and information about such laws can be obtained from the relevant state attorney general's office. So how exactly do service animal handlers go about providing this credible verbal assurance that their animal is a service animal? Or maybe you're on the other side and you're not sure if an animal is a pet or a service animal and the handler's disability isn't obvious. Well, in those cases, there are two allowable questions you can ask a service animal handler. The first question is, is this service animal required because of a disability? And the second question is, what task or work has the animal been trained to perform? You cannot ask about the person's disability or require medical documentation, or you cannot require a special identification card or training documentation for the dog because, as we know, this doesn't really exist under the ADA. You also should not ask um, a service animal handler to have their dog or miniature horse demonstrate its ability to perform the work or task because sometimes the work or task that the, that the um, animal has been trained to perform is dependent on the person's disability, such as a seizure alert dog. So, you know, a seizure alert dog couldn't perform their, their task on the spot. And once we get past or even forego that credible verbal assurance piece, there are still behavioral expectations for service animals to have public access. The animal must be housebroken and always under control. A leash is not required if someone's disability prevents the use of a leash or the animal's task requires it to be off leash, such as if the animal is seeking help or clearing a room for someone with PTSD, for example. Service animals also must meet local licensing, vaccination, and registration requirements if all other animals in that locality must do so. Again, though, this does not mean registering the dog as an ADA dog because that kind of registry doesn't exist, but rather this would mean registering the dog with the local Humane Society, for example, which may be required of all other pets in that area. And finally, even if you are not involved with emergency preparedness on an organizational level, we can always be involved with our personal preparedness. Again, we can never be 100% prepared, nor can we anticipate every situation of emergency. However, a little bit of planning can go a really, really long way. So Consider the needs of yourself and your immediate community, whether that be your household, your office, etc. Consider those needs from various angles and then develop plans and secure resources based on those identified needs. So consider access and functional needs. For example, do you have emergency meeting locations with your household members? Do you have a family member or a friend with access and functional needs who could have to develop a transportation plan with you? Do you have phone numbers available if you don't have access to your cell phone contacts? Do you have, you know, a safe word developed with your friends or family member and know the procedure when someone uses that word? It's also helpful to assemble personal emergency kits and devices. You know, you want to consider, do I have a go bag with backups of necessary supplies if I'm ever in an emergency and have to evacuate really quickly? Also, you want to know who to call in various emergency situations, especially if someone around you has a disability that could result in an emergency, such as having allergies, asthma, epilepsy, etc. So numbers could to call could be 911, maybe in certain situations it'd be better to call a non-emergency number or a crisis service or another social service or family members, et cetera. You just wanna identify what those situations could be and what to do and who to call if those situations arise. And finally, share your emergency plans with everyone who needs to know. Again, this may require using materials of various formats to best reach everyone who's kind of in that need to know circle. And with that, um, I want to thank you all again for attending today's session and any other previous sessions from this series. Uh, your ADA centers will continue to be 
here as a resource beyond today. So please contact us if you have any questions at all. And thank you again. And at this time, I want to go ahead and use the last 15-ish minutes for any questions that anyone might have. But thanks again for being here.